With lucky landslots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. Dearly beloved, we are gathered here today to... Has anyone seen the bride and groom? Sorry, sorry, we're here. We were getting lucky in the limo and we lost track of time. <gasps> no, Lucky Land Casino, with cash prizes that add up quicker than a guest registry. In that case, I pronounce you lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Daily bonuses are waiting. No purchase necessary. Void were prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. The French Revolution set Europe ablaze. It was an age of enlightenment and progress, but also of tyranny and oppression. It was an age of glory and an age of tragedy. One man stood above it all. This was the age of Napoleon. I'm Everett Rummage, host of the Age of Napoleon podcast. Join me as I examine the life and times of one of the most fascinating and enigmatic characters in modern history. Look for the Age of Napoleon wherever you find your podcasts. Welcome to Pax Britannica. Season 2, Episode 62, The Sack of Cashel. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. I'm your host, Samuel Hume. Before we begin today, we have to welcome the new members of my Patreon, House of Lords. The Earl of Chester, Justin Shofstall, Chris Earl, Viscount Oblitus, and Corsham, Viscount Glasgow. They, along with every other patron, receive ad-free podcasts. Go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica to find out more. Last time, we saw the New Model Army lose patience with the political Presbyterians in London and march on the English capital. Months of mutual suspicion led to the complete breakdown of Parliament's control over their army, and in August 1647, General Fairfax and General Cromwell took the city without a fight. They brought a VIP with them, though they deliberately left him outside the city. Charles I, King of England, Ireland and Scotland. The king had no armies. His family was either in exile or in the custody of his enemies, and yet he was still dangerous. He had not given up his hopes of restoring his fortunes by playing his enemies off against each other, with himself ending up back on top. Part of his hopes rested with his other two kingdoms, and today we'll see how events in Ireland gave him hope that help would soon come. When we were last in Ireland, we saw how the Irish parliamentary faction was just as divided as it was in England. Ireland became, in effect, a political front of the struggle between the Presbyterians and the independents in London. In Munster, the parliamentarians were split between the Lord President, Baron Inchiquin, who had the backing of the political Presbyterians, and Lord Broghill, his second-in-command and rival, who had the support of the independents. This was not a purely political debate. When the independents were ascendant in London, Inchiquin's authority was challenged and his supplies rerouted to Broghill. For a brief period in early 1647, Broghill was the de facto commander of parliamentary forces in the province, serving directly under the new independent Lord Deputy, Viscount Lyle, and effectively shutting Inchiquin out of the decision-making. This was to be short-lived, though. When we left Munster in 258, the Presbyterians had re-secured their influence in London in February and March 1647. This was the escalation of events we've covered in the last two episodes, and which included their dominance of the Derby House Committee, which, on paper, governed the war effort in Ireland. Adding to these changing political winds in England was the decision of the Royalist Lord Deputy, the Duke of Ormond, to reopen negotiations with the English Parliament to hand over Dublin. In April, the commission of the Lord Deputy Lyle came up for renewal, and Presbyterians in Parliament blocked it and summoned him back. This removed an awkward issue of two rival Lord Deputies easing any negotiations with Ormond, and it pulled the rug out from under Broghill. Through the spring of 1647, Inchiquin re-established his authority over the monster forces, and officers who had backed Broghill were punished. 
Inchiquin was well aware that only military success in the summer could secure his position, even as Broghill's allies continued to lobby against him as the political tide turned in England. Inchiquin's Gaelic heritage was weaponised against him. Reinforcements from Bristol to Munster were pressured to swear not to serve, quote, under the command of an Irishman, end quote. When the New Model Army began to move against the Presbyterians in London, he was included in their grievances. The charges against the 11 members, the treasons they were accused of committing, included their protection of Inchiquin against charges of sedition and their preventing of Lyle's Lord Deputyship. Once Parliament caved to the army's pressure and the 11 members were suspended or otherwise made themselves scarce, the independents once again took charge of the Irish War. On the 22nd of July, a pamphlet was published attacking Inchiquin as an Irish general and allegedly repeating the complaints of his troops who resented being commanded by the natural Irish. On the 27th, it was confirmed that Lord Broghill would be returned to power in Ireland, only, quote, by the advice and consent of the Lord Broghill, end quote, would decisions take place in Munster. A contemporary put it nicely, quote, the Lord Inchiquin is like to be well counselled by those who accused him of treason, end quote, which is a pretty hostile work environment. When the army took London, the relationship between the Lord President and the English Parliament collapsed entirely. The Derby House Committee, now firmly back under the control of the independents, denied Inchiquin supplies once again. The situation in Munster was almost as toxic across the lines. The Confederate Munster army was in shambles, courtesy of a power struggle within the Confederates' political and military ranks. The fallout from Rinaccini's coup meant that the so-called clerical faction vied for control over the Munster army with the so-called peace, or Ormond faction. The Ormond faction had only recently had their leaders released from imprisonment, leaders like Viscount Muscury. In Munster, a compromise was agreed by the Supreme Council. Rinaccini's man, the Earl of Glamorgan, remember him? Well, he was appointed as the general of the Munster army. But to appease the peace faction, Glamorgan's second in command would be one Patrick Purcell. And like the best of compromises, this pleased no one. Glamorgan had his supplies and funding diverted by allies of Muscury, and so could only muster around 3,000 men. Then, the clerical faction orchestrated a coup against Purcell and had him replaced with someone they trusted. Muscury then carried out a counter-coup a month later, placing himself in overall command. He informed the Supreme Council that he had only done so for the good of the cause, because the general of the Ulster army, Hugh Rowe O'Neill, was going to declare himself King of Ireland. Porig Lenehan suggests that Muscury's actual aim was to bring about a revival of the First Ormond Peace, and so his control over one of the Confederacy's main armies was key to this. Whether the Supreme Council believed his reasons or not, they accepted the result of his counter-coup to keep the peace. A Confederate civil war was averted, for now. But even though Muscury was now leading the Munster army, he suddenly found that several of the army's leading officers refused to serve under him, and withdrew their forces from his command. So, by the start of August, Muscury handed the command over to Lord Taff. Taff was a former royalist and an ally of Muscury, but Muscury would soon regret giving such an important command to him. This left Muscury free to fight the political battles within the Confederacy knowing that one of its key military positions was held by an ally. Taff had only been in his position for a few days when Inchiquin invaded Limerick in August. He could only muster around 2,000 men to try and stop Inchiquin's 6,000, so Inchiquin had free reign to threaten Limerick. The next month, in September, Inchiquin ravaged the productive lands of South Tipperary. This area had been relatively untouched by the fighting so far, and so this was a serious blow to the Confederates' ability to feed their own armies. This was then followed up by Inchiquin's attack on the town and rock of Cashel, and one of the worst massacres in the Irish Wars. The rock of Cashel in County Tipperary is an ancient site in Irish history. Legend has St. Patrick converting the King of Munster to Christianity here, 
and the kings of Munster ruled from the rock for centuries before donating it to the church in 1101. It's a highly defensible position, kissed by the breeze of creation, and so Lord Taft placed a garrison of 300 men there when Inchiquin began his campaign in Tipperary in 1647. Upon arrival, Inchiquin demanded the unconditional surrender of the garrison. When the defenders attempted to negotiate, Inchiquin ordered an attack. Spearheaded by dismounted cavalry, the parliamentary forces quickly breached the walls of the ancient compound and pushed the garrison back until they fell back into the cathedral. The defenders held the building for some time, until Inchiquin's forces used ladders to breach through its windows. A brutal close-quarters battle raged throughout the church for half an hour, until the last surviving Confederate troops retreated up the bell tower. About 60 men made it up the stairs, and in the cramped structure they could hold out for some time. So, quarter was offered, and they accepted it. They descended the tower, disarmed themselves in front of their conquerors, and then they were slaughtered. This summary execution of prisoners was far from unique, and we'll see other examples in this episode alone, but what makes the sack of Cashel such an infamous event is the killing of civilians. Hundreds of non-combatants who either lived at Cashel, either at the site or in the town, or had fled before Inchquin's forces, had sought shelter on the rock. With the small exceptions of a few wealthy prisoners who could afford their ransom, and a few women who were allowed to live, though only after facing brutal treatment, Inchiquin's forces killed everyone they found. A few leaders, including the bishop and mayor of Cashel, survived by hiding, but hundreds were executed. Cashel was looted of all its valuables, as were the bodies of the slain, and the symbols of Catholic worship were either destroyed or desecrated. When Inchiquin's army departed Cashel, all they left behind were the bodies of the dead and the town in flames. Inchiquin, whose name was Murrah O'Brien, earned the sobriquet Murrah of the Burnings, or Murrah the Burner, for his actions at Cashel. The sack of Cashel stood as the largest massacre of the Irish Confederate Wars, certainly since the outbreak of the rebellion in 1641. It was only surpassed almost two years later, when Oliver Cromwell took Drogheda. But that's a story for another time. Spin your passion into a business with Shopify and break sales records with the world's best converting checkout. Let's hear that one more time. The world's best converting checkout. Shopify's legendary checkout makes it easier for customers to shop on your website, across social media, and everywhere in between. Now that's music to your ears. Any way you spin it, you can be a smash hit with Shopify. Start your dollar a month trial today at shopify.com slash records. Madame Tussaud. We all know the name, and many of us have visited one of the wax museums which bear that name but you may not realise the historical significance of the woman behind the name, or how she and her waxworks defined the genre of true crime. If that has piqued your interest, then give The Art of Crime a listen. The Art of Crime is a history podcast by Gavin Whitehead, a historian of Victorian theatre, all about the unlikely collisions between true crime and the arts. If you enjoy the detail of Pax Britannica, then you'll love The Art of Crime. The latest season of The Art of Crime tells two stories, First, it chronicles Tussaud's career, starting in pre-revolutionary France and ending in Victorian London. Second, it tracks the evolution of the Chamber of Horrors, a showroom in her wax museum that exhibited macabre curiosities, including effigies of notorious criminals. You'll hear how Tussaud won patronage from the French royal family, narrowly escaped the guillotine during the Reign of Terror, and became one of the most celebrated showwomen in Paris and London. This season also covers the most divisive assassin of the French Revolution, the last man to be hung, drawn, and quartered for high treason in England, and the glamorous murderer who attained notoriety as a modern Lady Macbeth. Subscribe to The Art of Crime wherever you get your podcasts. Further to the north, Parliament's new Lord Deputy enjoyed some notable successes against the Confederates. Colonel Michael Jones, a veteran of the English Civil War, had arrived in June at the head of 2,000 men. After Ormond completed the handover of authority, he departed for England in July, and left Jones in full command. 
During this time, the Confederate general, Thomas Preston, had spent the previous few months taking a series of castles, and in July his armies besieged the castle at Trim. Jones, now secure in his position, set out from Dublin on the 1st of August. Over the following days, he rendezvoused with other parliamentary forces from the garrisons of Drogheda and Dundalk, and gathered a substantial force together. With about 6,500 men, he marched to relieve Trim, and Preston pulled back across the River Boyne. The Confederates, aware that Jones was following them, prepared to face the Parliamentarians, and they drew up on Dungan's Hill on the 8th of August, 1647. Confederate forces slightly outnumbered those of Jones, but not by much. Notable reinforcements came from the forces of Alistair McCullough, who had returned from Scotland after being forced out by Argyle and Leven in May. It may be that Preston was surprised by the quick advance of parliamentary forces and failed to adequately prepare, because the Battle of Dungan's Hill was a devastating defeat for the Confederates. It's also been argued that Jones, being a veteran of the Civil War, was just more experienced and competent than Preston. Preston's army took about 3,000 casualties at the battle, mostly after a large portion of the army fled into a nearby bog. Jones ordered his forces to surround the bog, and then dispatched infantry into the marsh, while his cavalry caught and killed anyone trying to flee. What followed was a massacre. Jones offered quarter only to a few officers, and so even those Irish soldiers who threw down their weapons were killed without mercy. Parliamentary accounts, including Jones's own report, state this matter-of-factly. Irish accounts record more grisly details, accusing the parliamentarians of accepting surrendering soldiers, tying their hands, and then summarily executing them. The number of men killed after this battle is exceptional, and so historians have tried to explain it. One argument is that perhaps this was Jones's attempt to make his mark in the theatre. He was a new commander, the new Lord Deputy of the Kingdom of Ireland, and these were rebels. In this view, the executions were a stamp of his authority. It's suggested by Porig Lenehan that the violence in the bog of Dungan's Hill displayed the newness of Jones's force. Many were veterans of the Civil War in England, but they were new to the Irish War. After years of hearing tales of Irish cruelties towards prisoners, perhaps they saw this behaviour as mutually assured. If the situation was reversed, the Confederates would surely have butchered them. Except, as we've seen, they probably wouldn't. Earlier in the war, in the first months of the rebellion and the early campaigns of the English and Scottish armies, massacres of surrendering soldiers were common. But this bloodthirstiness cooled off over time, as it became accepted that prisoners could be exchanged, and it was better for everyone if civilians and surrendering soldiers were treated well. In this framework, Jones's force was yet to learn these practicalities, and this helps explain their ruthless killing of prisoners. But Lenehan also offers another motive, grim pragmatism. Jones's army simply could not guard, feed, or move 3,000 or more surrendering men. The Confederates would not ransom more than a handful, and how many of the ordinary infantrymen had the resources to pay for their own release? And just allowing that many men to escape, or releasing them after the fact, to return to their commands was not an acceptable choice. Better, this ruthless logic argues, to kill all but a few. The officers were generally taken prisoner. They had the connections and resources to make their imprisonment worthwhile. Of the ordinary rank-and-file infantry, only around 200 were spared. Eventually, they were released for free as a goodwill gesture by Jones. The Confederacy did not ransom even this small number. However it happened, between two and a half and 5,000 Confederate soldiers were killed at Dungan's Hill effectively destroying Preston's Leinster army. In the following days, Jones marched on Maynooth and captured it, and the Confederates withdrew from a number of garrisons across Kildare and Wexford. In the wake of these two defeats, Cashel and Duncan's Hill, the Confederates were reeling, and Parliament went on the offensive. In October, Jones linked up with one General Monk, who I think we last saw all the way back in 222, when he arrived in Ireland in February 1642, 
and who we'll certainly see a lot more of in the future. Together, Jones and Monk campaigned through North Leinster, clearing out garrisons left by O'Neill. O'Neill was limited in how he could respond. Not only had he split his forces, sending reinforcements first to Preston and then to Taff, but he had to remain in South Leinster in case Jones attempted to link up with Inchiquin. His job was to block any such rendezvous. The Supreme Council decided to prevent any chance of such a link-up by ordering Lord Taff to engage Inchiquin's force and destroy it. On the 13th of November, Taff led around 7,500 infantry and 1,200 cavalry and formed up on the high ground at Nocnanus. Inchiquin arrived three miles away on the same day, with only 4,000 infantry and 1,200 cavalry, and the following day he seems to have sent a message to Taff, asking him to come down off his hill and, quote, fight upon a fair plain. Shockingly enough, even Taff, who is not rated very highly as a commander by any of the historians I've read, even he understood the tactical advantage of having higher ground, and so Inchiquin's polite request was ignored. Undeterred, Inchiquin formed up to the west of Taff and prepared to advance uphill against a dug-in enemy who outnumbered his force by two and a half thousand men. Taft's army was certainly larger, but it was a hodgepodge force. Alongside the bulk of his Munster army were reinforcements from elsewhere in Ireland. Three regiments had arrived from Connacht, and 1,500 infantry had arrived from O'Neill's forces, the reinforcements I mentioned earlier. The bulk of these were led by our old friend Alistair McCullough. Yes, he survived Scotland, he survived Dungan's Hill, he's still here leading his fearsome Highlanders. But this meant that a good portion of Taft's army had little experience fighting together, and the disunity of the Confederate leadership was on full display at Nocnanus. As Inchiquin's forces advanced up the hill, and after a volley of cannon fire killed some of his men, McCullough ordered his forces to advance. Either, as Inchiquin believed at the time, because he refused to sit still to be shot at by artillery, or, as Lipscomb notes, because he was wary of being outflanked. When parliamentary forces chased some fleeing cavalry up the hill, they were met by the Highland warriors. And what else did they do but the tactic which had conquered Scotland for the Marquis of Montrose? They performed the Highland Charge. Unleashing a volley of musket fire into the disorganised parliamentarians, they then dropped their guns, drew their claymores, strapped on their charges, and charged into the surprised soldiers. And just as it had worked in Scotland, it worked here. The men broke and ran for their lives. McCullough and his men chased them all the way down the hill and into the artillery battery which had only just been firing at them. Capturing the cannons, the Highlanders turned them around and fired them into the rest of the parliamentary forces, before an even greater prize caught their eye. The baggage train. So, of course, they went to loot whatever they could carry. In the meantime, the rest of Taft's force was having a very bad time. He'd moved his remaining infantry to cover the gap opened by McCullough's unplanned offensive, but Inchiquin successfully outmaneuvered him. Tricked into countering a fake flanking manoeuvre with his own cavalry, the parliamentarian cavalry caught them out of position and broke them. When the cavalry routed, they collided with the infantry who were right behind them, who also panicked and fled. The monster infantry allegedly fired only a single volley before breaking and running, despite the efforts of Taft to rally them. Inchiquin then turned his attention to McCullough, who was now returning to the field, laden with booty, to find that the battle was effectively lost. Caught out of position and out of formation, the Highlanders either fought to the death or surrendered, only to then be executed. The second was reportedly McCullough's fate. After most of his men were killed in repeated cavalry charges, and with no way to escape, McCullough surrendered, only to be summarily shot by a new English officer. This was not the glorious death in combat which McCullough surely expected, but somewhere, in a shallow grave on the shores of Loch Linney, the headless Lord Auchenbreck might have appreciated the poetic justice. This was another crushing defeat for the Confederates. Around 3,000 men had been killed at Nocnanus. 
In the wake of this latest disaster, and after a thoroughly disappointing year, the terms of the First Ormond Peace started to look pretty good. The Confederacy convened a general assembly, which was, to quote Lenehan, less an Ormondist coup than a pragmatic response by a broadly representative body to changing military and political realities, end quote. The changing military realities were the decisive defeats of the past few months. Dungan's Hill had effectively destroyed the Confederate Leinster army, and Nocnanus had meant the same for their Munster army. Perhaps peace, and an alliance with the Royalists along the terms of the Ormond Peace, was the best path forward. The changing political realities are what we will cover next episode. Because ever since the events we covered last episode, and crucially with the New Model Army's seizure of London, royalism was rapidly being redefined. Inchiquin himself, despite winning these victories in the name of Parliament, and in spite of the exceptional violence against prisoners and civilians, was still courted by both the Confederate peace faction and agents of the King. He'd won these battles, after all, in spite of Parliament, not because of their aid. The independents who held sway in London still did not trust him, and he would soon look to other sources of support. Thank you to my House of Lords, including but not limited to the King's favourite, Mike Sanders, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersich, the Marquess of Hull, Steve Cloutier, and the Earl Talbot, Tom Cozens. Remember that every patron, regardless of rank, receives an RSS feed, which you can put in any podcast app to listen to the podcast ad-free. If you want to support the podcast in other ways, please recommend it to a friend or post about the show on social media. Thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for the interval music in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah. Oh. Sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right, ChumbaCasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchases, over prohibited by law, 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details.